them a minute or two, but I'm going to start about now. So, housekeeping, first things first. In regards to this talk, there's the website, yes. Oops. And here's the calendar. Now, what I'd like to point out is if you click here somewhere, you're going to come up to the actual talk. And the reason why I bring this up is actually what I've shown to you in the business card on the back. There's two talks I'm doing today and tomorrow. With this talk, I actually updated this this morning. That's the HTTP path for the GitLab for the repo. Now, what the repo possesses isn't just the slides. There are also working scripts. Um, obviously, it's, you, you, you would have to adapt it to your environment to suit your needs. But the idea is that you go through it, you figure it out, and then you discover all the wonders of, oh my god, look at what I can do type of thing. Um, now, Something I also noticed. That's not me. That's not. What are you? That's him. That's Tiago. Um, we are going to split this presentation into two halves. Basically, it's still in the time, same time frame. Um, but this was a cooperative effort. Um, when the slides start, you're going to see the email address where I'm working at one company, but I actually work simultaneously as a consultant for Benefits by Design, which is based in uh, actually Kingston, Ontario, but has its offices a little bit everywhere, including Vancouver or Coquitlam. And don't ask me to spell Coquitlam. I can't spell Coquitlam unless I think it out and write out the letters. Um, so. So, um, basically this talk, as you can see from the description, it is an overview of a migration exercise. Now, it's still ongoing. It started about sometime last year. But I would say in terms of complete man hours, like just speaking for myself and what I've done, uh, we're talking about a month, a month and a half's worth of work uh, for somebody who is working in real time, which isn't very much considering the depth, the value, and the complexity of the database itself. We have a SQL Server system. The business is a business-to-business -business, uh, type of setup where it helps out other businesses dealing with their issues in regards to insurance policies, etc., etc. Now, I'm not an expert on the business model. Other people can better explain it. Suffice to say that the system has been working well for many years, but we live in a new age. We want to be able to scale up. We want to be able to go into the cloud. We want to be able to do all sorts of things. We want to improve performance, redundancies, to be able to do more. And the traditional means, using proprietary technology, um, well, there was a time when that was the choice, but it isn't the only choice now. Everybody knows all the businesses are going into the cloud, and everybody knows that the cloud is using open source technology. And the biggest conventional, traditional type of database design is Postgres. Now, funny thing about Postgres is it is underappreciated as to its flexibility. It can tie into literally anything under the sun. It can tie into another relational database, or it can tie into no cloud technologies. Now, the latest word on no cloud is that they're trying to expand into the more traditional realms, which is asset compliance, the ability to have standard data can be reliable and consistent, they're running into problems. Because their raison d'etre, their first reason to exist, was to basically perform high writes or high redundancies. And then there's all these theorems and explanations like CAP that says, hey, you only can get two choices out of three of whether or not you want performance or consistency or accessibility. You can't have everything. So there are problems. A lot of companies are now working with Postgres by a new generation of people. I've been around a long time. See, gray hair. So that's changing. So what I'm going to try to do is not talk too much, because I talk too much. Uh, my wife tells me I talk too much. So I'm going to try to give you a big picture overview of 
the migration process. And Tiago, what he's going to do is he will finish off by actually going into the actual technical details. Now, the Git has bash scripts. And it's amazing to consider that we've actually migrated a system that can make or break a company using just a few couple of bash scripts. But it's the theory behind it. And that's what I want to cover, the idea. Oh, and for anybody who's curious, I picked that up years ago. I love it. I, I, it it's great. Nice big elephant having a nice, comfortable evening roasting fish. It, back in the day, that would have been MySQL Dolphin. But I hear that other companies are using Dolphin. So hey, we can relate to that. And uh, Lloyd, the person who did the original, well, first talk this morning, he gave me this little click. This is great. So, cool. So here's the repo. Uh, the original repo was on the Git. And here's the updated GitLab. It's basically, it's the same path. If you just go to GitLab, you just copy paste, mark on the business card, you'll find it. As well, when you get to there using a web interface, if you go up a link, you'll see all the presentations so far. And I'd like to have done more presentations, but there's only so much time in the day. And I'm still unpacking because we moved in only a month or so going to our new house. That being said, a migration going from SQL Server to Postgres. I'm going to try to just cover in my half the overview, the big picture. The objective isn't to describe at this point the details. The picture is to help you, especially if you have advanced enough in Postgres, especially if you've been in the industry long enough, you can figure things out. If it's one thing I've learned about competent people, they don't like playing with other people. They're like cats. <laughs> They're very individualistic. There's a term in the, the Postgres community that some of the leadership uses. Uh, getting Postgres to do something, the people, the community, is like herding cats. <laughs> so we have a Postgres system. To be able to access other technology, we need, this is the simplified summary. The first slide is the summary. We're installing what's called a foreign data wrapper. A foreign data, data wrapper is a generic technology that was put in some time ago into Postgres where other projects, other can create modules, and those modules connect into other technologies. Those technologies can be files, they can be Oracle databases systems, they could be MySQL systems, they could be other uh, Postgres systems, they could be Hadoop, they could be the, the, the virtually anything under the sun. They are a facility that makes a remote data store look like a Postgres data store. It proxies out, connects, does whatever it does, and pulls in. Now, foreign data wrappers are at different stages of evolution, different levels of complexity and sophistication. The SQL Server foreign data wrapper used in this exercise was to create the tables in Postgres, define them, and pull the data. That's it. No heavy-duty querying, nothing. Just pull the data, get it there, and move on. The foreign data wrapper needs connectivity information. So you get the foreign data wrapper, you install it in Postgres, you get the connection information, and then you create your foreign tables. Now again, this is the blow by blow simplified approach. There's more detail as we go on. Once we get the foreign tables, the definitions in place, if you do a select all from my table, which exists on SQL Server, after a little bit, you'll start seeing records coming in. And then at that point, you just use standard SQL to populate another table, the real table, into Postgres. There's where you're done. That's how the migration was conducted. Here's how we worked. Postgres 9.6. At the time when we started, we're using, we were using 9.6. We've since then gone up to Postgres 10, which for us wasn't a big deal. We needed to decide what the database was going to look like. Um, it really helps when there's one thought, one force behind. Uh, so in this context, certain arbitrary decisions can be made. But the thing about decisions is you can't set them in stone. People change their minds, demands change. So when you make it, it's to get the job done, but don't think too far ahead. Figure out your jobs just a couple of steps ahead and be ready to alter it, to update it. So 
figure out what the database is going to look like. That's the schemes. That's the permissions. What's the point? Well, the point is first to get the data there. Who's going to see it? Well, at the beginning, it's just you, which is fine. Keep the model simple. You create your table schemas. Then comes the interesting part. You have a foreign data wrapper. You can connect into SQL Server, but we don't want to just read the data. We want to actually import SQL Server into Postgres. How are we going to do that? Well, first, what are we going to pull over? We're going to pull over the functions, tables, constraints, views, triggers. Everything that SQL Server has, we need to reproduce and reconstitute in Postgres. Now, on a simple level, when you've got one table, one table constraint, that's not that. You could even sort of figure it out on your own wrap it. But in our case, we had one. Like almost a thousand tables, 400 views, and some of those views were views uh -huh. writing, reading other views. Then we had like a couple thousand binary keys, foreign keys, check constraints. This is not copy paste. So the secret, and it's not a secret, it's awareness, it's just knowing. When you work on this level of technology, it's a bit like belief, it's an act of faith. The act of faith is that there is a corollary, that you can see patterns in one technology, you will find the similarity in another technology. The act of faith is, hey, the way I work with Postgres, this should exist in SQL Server. That's the act of faith. And the act of faith is based on this right here. System catalogs and tables of interest. The system catalogs in a relational database defines how a database system thinks about itself. It's metadata. It's information about the information. It's information describing the tables. Information describing the primary keys. Information describing the function calls. If you know where those are, if you can read them, then you can work with them. And those catalogs are actually accessible. If you've got super user capability, even ordinary user accounts for most of these catalogs, you can read the information. And what you can read from a catalog is reading from a table. And if you can read from a table, you can write to another table. The last part, the hardest part, are function calls. SQL Server calls them sprocks. Every time I hear sprocks, I think of cars with broken gears. The functions have their own way of being written. Now, we have what's called ANSI standard. It's a body where the leading vendors and community come together, they get drunk, and in between drunks, they decide what everything is going to look like. Now, everybody has agreed what a table should look like, how behaviors, how queries should look like, how you should establish SQL. What they didn't agree on was procedural languages, what the procedural languages look like. There was never an agreement, and there to date isn't any agreement as to procedural languages. So the TSQL and the SQL Server is different from Postgres, but they're similar. The hard part is how do you migrate all that and massage it into Postgres. We'll cover that a little bit. But the gist of it is, a complicated, complex system, eventually, after you've massaged it, after you've organized it in the professional manner that you want it to be, you're going to look. You're going to look at these queries, and you're going to have to rewrite them in a format that is unique to Postgres, because there are unique things to Postgres, as there are unique things to SQL Server. This is hard work. And this is going to require a lot of teamwork. Now, after you've decided, yes, you're going to install the, the foreign data wrapper. Like all of this up to this point is basically decisions. You're just deciding. That's, it. That's what this slide is about. It's just deciding. You configure. You create your foreign table. Creating a foreign table is easy. If everything is well executed, it's instantaneous. All it does is define connection information and what the table's going to look like. Then you populate the table. Again, if it's successfully created, that's a standard SQL. 
Once a table is populated, it's now you're turning more into conventional activities. You apply the constraints. You apply primary keys. You apply your check constraints. Once you've got those in place, then you apply your foreign keys. Rule of thumb in Postgres, when you have lots of data, the first step is to just populate it with data and then apply the constraints. The reason is, is because it's more efficient. It's faster populating tables and then putting the constraints on. If you put a constraint on a table, it's going to take time. If you have complicated systems and interdependencies existent, well, you've made actually a lot more work for yourself because that means you're bound by the order in which you populate tables. Because if you order certain tables, that means you can't populate other tables until those dependent tables have been filled out. So having the constraints off to the side eliminates that problem. Triggers. Unless you're in a very unique situation, triggers normally aren't too complicated. There's not too many. And Traditionally, triggers are applied for tables when you update, delete, insert, which is kind of nice because it makes things simple. There are fancy triggers in a SQL Server. There are fancy triggers in Postgres that have larger views. There, there are triggers applied when you do something anywhere in the database. There are triggers that for statements or triggers just for uh, an entire transaction. In our case, our triggers were limited. And in Postgres, it was kind of nice because he was, he, we were able to create one file that encountered all the DML operations and it was all programmatic. In SQL Server, triggers are defined individually, separately for every action. According to the ANSI standard, triggers are fired in the order they're created. Doesn't matter what their name is, doesn't matter their importance. Postgres is a little more intuitive. It's alphabetical order. So you write a trigger, it's going to be fired in the order of the alphabet. Uh, English alphabet, <coughs> or French alphabet, it's our time. Um, because there's no accents, because French has accents and English does not. That's another story. So alphanumeric order and triggers. Triggers can be encapsulated in single definitions in, in Postgres as opposed to SQL Server. Being aware of these things helps because it cuts down on the learning curve. Process views. Views, in our situation, was a bit of a box of mess. The views had been built over a long period of time. Eventually, in a mature company, you have people come and people go. It's like Hunger Games for IT. <laughs> Uh, so eventually, what makes a company stand or fall is the structure that those people participated and worked in. Over time, these views grew and to satisfy business requirements, which means we need a report and we need it in X amount of time, sometimes they just wrote a view that depended on another view. There are no rules on when rules, views should be constructed. So sometimes when this was being rebuilt, the views would break because it depended on another view that didn't exist yet because it was going to be played at an instruction later on. So, fun times. The secret sauce to migrating between SQL Server and Postgres, which actually applies to any technology that you want to connect with Postgres, is the ANSI compliant rules. And it is the greatest thing that I want to say about SQL Server. It is, it always has tried to make an ANSI compliant attempt. Rules are set up, they're published, they're industry standards, and Microsoft has always attempted to follow it as closely as possible, as opposed to people like Oracle, who sometimes they break things because they can make more money when they break things. Just talk about Java. Now, schema sys is a special schema that exists in SQL Server. Schema, PG Catalog, is a special schema that exists in Postgres. They are the catalogs. They are the dictionaries. They are the metadata. Information describing information. The information schema is the ANSI compliance standard. 
both projects, commercial, open source, make sincere attempts. Heads up. I would say they're about 80%, 85% equivalent. There are going to be differences, and we did encounter them during the migration exercise. But not a big deal, because I expected it. When we create things, there are operations in SQL, operations in function calls, that are a little different. How do you handle that? Do you change it physically one at a time, or do you do something else? In this case, the objective was, the first phase was just to get the thing migrated over so people could work on it. That meant that we would take advantage of Postgres's overloading capability. Not just function calls, but operators. When there are symbols in SQL Server and you put them together, they do a certain result. In pure Postgres, the result isn't the same. So, what we did was create overloaded those functions, allowing those processes to continue. The reason was that the views themselves used these kind of definitions. And there were hundreds of views. So rather than take apart the views at the outset, we just said, okay, let's identify the operators, put them in, make sure that they compile into Postgres properly, that you can create them, and then let the development teams deal with them as they need them, as the migration progresses. Recognize the obvious. It's a lot of work. You can save a lot of work by being organized, but at the end of the day, the heaviest work is going to be the function calls themselves. Do you keep a, a, a list of those ones where you made the decision to let the, just to overload it and to move forward? Keep a list of those so that three years down the road, when you do the next migration to a Postgres you know, 12 or 13, some of those things don't work you know which ones to go after. There's two ways. One thing I learned a long time ago about databases, they are foundational to a business's success. A database that is well written, is mature, is a self-documenting system. You can not only figure out what, a, what data is supposed to do, where it's supposed to go, you can actually figure out how a company makes money. By looking at the database, you can tell a lot of things. What you're talking about, it's an important point, and if you take your time to do it right, you'll see it. It'll be obvious inside the Postgres database system. For example, there's an attribute called comment in Postgres. It's there for one reason. Document. You want to say something? Comment on this table. Comment on this row. Comment on this database. Comment on this trigger. It's self-documented. You put in, you, you demand a standard of communication so people will see it. The person, the date, the JIRA ticket, the project attribution, all that works. Another thing, repos, at the very beginning of the slide, the Git repository. Yes, versioning control, extremely important. Keep things as simple as possible so you can see the versions. When you start with this, something else. DBAs are usually in small to medium companies unique. They are by themselves and they are surrounded by teams of developers. There's a reason for that. Companies make money by providing services. DBAs are there to prevent the company from sinking. That happens because the data itself matures, grows roots. It's like a weeping willow out there. If you know anything about a weeping willow tree, it is guaranteed to destroy your drainage and your pipes in 10, 20 years. A DBA is brought in to manage and wrangle the data. Developers are there to allow a business to make money. A DBA comes in to keep the money going, to control the environment. At this point, you want to create an environment that you know can be recreated. If you're in a good position that you master the technology, you're going to create your own environment. You don't need to import the whole data. What you need are essentials. You'll be able to reproduce it, you'll be able to work it out. This is really, really important. And Microsoft was really nice because last year, in their attempt to go into the cloud, they actually provided command line utilities for SQL Server. 
One month after this became available, I downloaded, installed it on our systems, and I used this to validate, to make sure that I understood what was going on in the SQL Server. It didn't matter that the SQL Server we had was actually in a Windows platform. It was compliant. So I was able to log in, double check, check the tables, check the columns, make sure the conversions. When there were edge cases, when I didn't know what was going on, having a dependable command line client really, really made a difference because it speeded things up. I wasn't confused. If you can, become comfortable with command line, with the terminal. Stay away from GUIs. GUIs are extremely useful for understanding concepts. Command lines are bare. The knowledge is in your head. That's why sometimes they're terrifying. But because they're bare, there's fewer moving parts. They don't break. And especially when they come with the server, they are extremely reliable. They become the authoritative mechanism describing what's going on. That's why with Postgres, use PSQL when you don't know what's going on, because it offers the best information. In this case, the MSSQL client, the SQL Server client, was a godsend. Because it allowed me to see what was going on from the way Microsoft wants us to understand it. And, it was, and I could work it in Bash. It was cool. This is a Postgres documentation. This is the example of the information schemas. These tables, again, eight out of 10 times, they exist in SQL Server. And if I click onto the links, they have almost virtually the same table structure, almost the same data column. It's great. It really, really does simplify life. Just be ready to see differences. This is the actual process. Again, Microsoft downloaded, put it in. Uh, initially, when this was done, uh, I did this simple. I have a Linux workstation. I created uh, containers. I use Linux containers because they emulate the OS faithfully, as opposed to Docker. Docker, I hate. Anybody talks to me Docker positively, I will buy a gun at Walmart and shoot you. However, when you go into a central isolated environment, you can reproduce exactly the dependencies. And in this case, you can download, install SQL Server uh, environments, and it works great. So in our case, how are we doing with time? Am I talking too much? OK. This is our layout. This was in consultation with the team. It was understood it would be temporary, because at some point, somebody was going to have a better idea. And they did. They said, we don't want any more schemas. We want it in one. And I said, are you certain? And, I, and they said, I'm paying you, aren't I? And I said, OK. That was me. <laughs> <laughs> so in terms of Postgres, in terms of Linux, this is the actual instructions. Again, about getting down to Postgres. All right, here's something to understand about Postgres. Postgres is available on every Linux distribution. Industry standard has CentOS, has Red Hat, has Ubuntu. The biggest, most popular OS used right now in the industry is CentOS. Because it is Red Hat light, but it is free. Ubuntu, they're making their inroads and they're actually pretty good. This is a Debian derivation. This is what the, uh, what I use here in my own environment. So what I've got is the instructions to download the community version. The community version is the most standards compliant. CentOS, for example, is a pain. If you have a CentOS OS, at some point, they just stop supporting the versions of Postgres, and they get old. You don't want that, because it's going to be aged. It's going to go out of date. On CentOS 6, for example, it's still being used in the industry. Well, the only Postgres they've got there, I think, is 8.4 and 9.2. Now, 8.4 went out, I think, five years ago. And 9.2, uh, it, well, it expired. It, it no longer was supported as of September last year. Now, there are repositories. There are exceptions. But again, there's all these added extra things. This is the central one. All the supporting packages needed to do everything we talked about, especially for data wrappers, are on the Postgres community side. Bite the bullet, go there, install it from there. The Postgres versions from the community also are capable and designed to explicitly have multiple data clusters and multiple versions of Postgres all sitting on the same machine. They're all 
nicely packed, they will all nicely register correctly, and you can bring it up. It adds to complexity, but if you're comfortable, it really, really is helpful because it's less confusing. You're not going to crash or clash things into with each other. The foreign data wrapper. Most foreign data wrappers are not ready-made. Most foreign data wrappers are a little bit aged in, if they are packaged and ready. But it doesn't mean they're out of date, it doesn't mean they're useless. The foreign data wrapper for the uh, SQL Server is available, but it's available in the source code. That means you have to compile it against a complete distribution of Postgres, <coughs> which means, again, if you downloaded the Postgres from the Postgres site, you can download all the necessary libraries that it will look for and find. This, the first line for the Debian environment are the packages that need to be present to install so that you can compile and prepare the foreign data wrapper. Once it's created, you can then install it, again, use the uh, configuration, and then you create the extension inside the database. Now, in more sophisticated environments, in higher level production environments, you're not going to be allowed to create an extension, say, in a production machine. What you do instead is you have a developed machine where you create the extension and you bundle it up as an RPM or the Debian package. That happens too. Uh, that doesn't come out so well on the colors, but let me see if I can hit the front light here a little bit. There we go. That helps a lot. Okay, so. Sorry, I just had to get out of the class. This is just a snippet. Okay, again, you'll see this in the batch script. Basically, these are defined environment variables. These are the environment variables used here. This is the connectivity information. I don't go into it very much. Create extension. There is a ceremony to creating, to adding the extension and configuring a foreign data wrapper. There's three parts to it. Basically, the foreign data wrapper is going to connect to something else out there. Well, you're going to need a server connection, then you're going to need the actual particular connection information, and then you're going to need the information that makes it a little bit secure, because you're going to restrict it to a user. So that's what all this does here. Now, all this exists and can be referenced in the Postgres documentation. Section 6, part 1, SQL command. I've got that memorized. You go there, you look for the command create extension. It's like a huge lineup of SQL commands, and that's your starting point. This is the command for importing the schema. Now, in the 9.6, this is very nice. SQL Server has all its default tables listed in one schema called DBO. So all I had to do was to declare it, declare my database, declare my schema, Here's the server configuration that I created, and all the tables that were in that schema gets migrated over as foreign tables. Now, these are definitions. We're not transferring data. We're transferring the connection information. These are pretend tables in Postgres that, when you query, are actually going to connect to the SQL Server and do its magic. And, for example, Example, create table T1 new like T1. In this particular case, we imported a table that was called T1. Okay. We're almost near the section here where uh, Tiago's going to take over. Issues, keep in mind about data types. Again, this is referring to how things are going to work. If you take something from SQL Server over to Postgres, you save yourself many, many, many hours by simply overloading the operators. What you have to do is you have to be consistent. Now, the thing about Postgres is it is cowboy. There is no set standard in the industry how to do something. It's like a cook. Only French cuisine has a standard of how to cook an egg. Everybody else has their own miracle ways of doing things. Your mother and your mother-in-law are not going to cook that egg the same way. It's going to be dependent. So you have to be very consistent. You set up the rules yourself. How are you going to look at things? How are you going to change things? Because it's very, very easy 
to overload. And then at some point, as you're going through the views of the, uh, the function, it says, well, maybe I'll write it this way. And suddenly you've broken your own standard. It still works, but it's not consistent. OK. That goes to the big question. Because at some point, hunger games, people are going to disappear. They're going to have new replacements. And they may not have SQL Server knowledge. You may have a hybrid system that is mature. Do you want an exercise of slowly migrating everything to pure Postgres? That's a really good question. Or do you leave it alone? And just let it build on itself. Just make sure it's stable from the outset and let it build in its own way. Questions? Things that you might have mentioned. Yes? Uh, I actually don't remember. How did we, you come up with the foreign wrapper? The foreign data wrapper? Yeah, to grab the system tables. I don't remember how that. The foreign data wrapper is available on the extensions. Uh, no, 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 no. I know, but I've only, I've never seen anybody else do it that way. I'm wondering how we, we came up with that solution to do it that way. Using the foreign data wrapper? Well, I've always known about the foreign data wrapper extension capabilities. Well, it was the first time you used it? That was the first time used for us that you used, yeah. But I've used it in different contexts. I did a, 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 um, a job a long time ago where I had to import some data from Oracle over to Postgres and foreign data wrappers were still experimental at the time. So I used that a little bit. But they're a very, very good concept. Foreign data wrappers I wouldn't use, especially the SQL Server one, for trying to do complex queries from Postgres onto SQL Server. The foreign data wrapper has its inefficiencies. So I always try to keep it as simple as possible. But the foreign data wrapper, I always had the idea of using it. But it only made sense, though, when I found out and confirmed that the information schemas matched. Yeah. Once they matched, I knew, oh my god, life is so much easier. OK, so we got considerations. These are different ways of doing things. This is the Linux way. That's the thing about Postgres. There is no real standard. It's up to you to decide or your environment. Lexical patterns. You know, th again, this is all old school stuff. Stuff that you may not know about, but maybe your, you know, your grandma. <laughs> OK. Uh, conversion considerations. These are examples of wonderfully useful function calls that existed in SQL Server that we were using that I had to deal with. I actually had to reproduce this because they were used all over the place in our system. I said, well, look, I guess I'm not going to change it. I'll just like the bullet, create the operators, and communicate to everybody it's there. And the decision of what to do is up to them. But by conforming it, it allowed me to convert the views without any problems. It allowed me to create the tables that already had check constraints, <coughs> that had dependencies on function calls, I just rewrote them, made sure that the process was duplicated. <coughs> and I confirmed that by using my SQL Server client, when I could just play around with it. OK. Tiago, I am sorry. Yes, but this is because you put your face on that page. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't me. <laughs> All right, let me get this out of the way, and I'll pass you the clicker, too. And you come on, I'll just pull myself out. And so this works instantly. You just plug it in. I think it's better to use the mouse. Oh, yeah. So, while Tiago's setting up, um, any questions so far? Yes? Did Postgres not have equivalent date functions that made you write your own? The date functions in Postgres, I would say, are the most comprehensive in, among relational database systems. But they're not named the same way, and they don't have the exact same behavior. Yeah. So you wrote functions to get the same behavior? Yeah. yeah. It, was, uh, it was, let's see what the SQL Server functions did. And it was not just reproduce the same effect, but to, to look the same way. That way, the learning curve wouldn't be too hard on the developers who had to conform everything. All they had to do was get used to the work process. Once they got used to working between SQL Server and Postgres, 
Then they could say, over a beer, say, okay, what are we going to do? What do we like? What do we don't like? They, don't, they didn't have that initial frustration of, oh my God, why isn't it working? That kind of thing. Yeah. So I'm just going to go quickly through the script that we used for the migration. This connection file, you set up the connection details, the host for Postgres, the database name that you're going to use, the user password. And down here, the SQL Server details the, for the users that are going to use to connect S. And the first script here, uh, you're going to create the foreign, tab foreign tables using the foreign data wrapper. And this is the script that it is <coughs> It's gonna, so, so firstly, it's gonna create a database with the set, settings that you set on that connection file. And th this is the schemas that we are, we're using for the migration that we, we divided. We're creating here. Yeah, can you make the range a little larger? How's that? Yeah, so here we're creating the extension of, no, of the data wrapper. And we're setting the, through the data wrapper, we're setting the server, the SQL Server uh, connection. And we're going to map the user that we're going to connect to the SQL Server as is. And Right here, let me put in. Yeah, and then, then, and then we're gonna run the, the query on the top. And that's gonna go through the, the tables on SQL Server and bring them all to Postgres on, the, on our schema run. And yeah, there's the first script. The second one, like after we create the tables, it's gonna populate them. So we're gonna using the connection uh, th the, through the wrapper. Gonna insert on a schema run all of the data. Uh, we may come up with a few uh, encoding issues. So an error will be thrown, and you you have to see how you work around on it on the SQL Server side. And after you populate the tables, you want to add the constraints. So the foreign keys. Oh, no, we're going to first populate the, the foreign, uh, foreign tables, uh, the, the information schemas, uh, set the, the environment, the, the, the PG catalog matches. <laughs> And yeah, here we're creating the in, in our schema run information. Uh, all all of the information tables from SQL Server that we ha we have access to the wrapper. So like constraint column usage, tables constraints, referential constraints, column usage, views, view table usage, view column usage, tables, objects, and with all those tables. We're gonna have access to the to get the foreign keys and the primary keys, and the check constraints and the constraints, and yeah, all of, all of these foreign tables, uh, and then after that, we're gonna populate the tables, the the information tables again. Like as the, as we did for the regular tables, we're doing again for the information tables, and then we're adding the using the, the those information tables. We add the primary keys for each table, and here we also added the unique constraints. So the next three script. We're adding the 
the foreign keys, which is a bit more complicated. But then it, it goes through through each table and also like the, the information tables will will give us all the details we need. Uh, if you go through the doc documentation, you find more details of it. Uh, and this is the script that we use to grab the the triggers definition. They're mostly NC compliant, so we won't have any issues converting. It's just a matter of checking few, just about checking issues. And for the views, we have separate scripts for the because of the issue we have that we have views calling on other views and so <coughs> we have to run all over again so there if a view one uh, it, it calls the view two inside it the view two has to be added first so what it does it loops through it again so on the first loop the view, the second view will be added, and then on the second loop, the f the first view will be added. And yeah, so that's the first one. And the, it will give us uh, the details about the errors that we have. Yes, uh, saying that error exists, and they want add add it again. And that's the script that adds the. The views that depend depend on other other views, and here include we update the views after we have all the views together, and last one we're gonna uh, get the views that will not be able to be created because of. Uh, differences like for example the operators or, or types that that don't match we're gonna have them on a on a table uh, at least all of the views that they didn't that weren't converted correctly and I think that was it for the scripts yes so is there anything else Robert that you want to add? The only thing I wanted to add about it was at the very end. Are you finished? Yeah. Alright, okay. um, right, so everybody, this is Tiago. Tiago was, let's see, uh, our uh, official BBB intern. Where Junior. are you from, Tiago? Brazil. Brazil. <laughs> Which means he doesn't speak Spanish, he speaks Portuguese. Portuguese. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've lost Spanish. <laughs> um, okay, so th thank you very much, Tiago. So, the only thing I'm going to add at the end of this is we did come up with some strange behaviors. Um, there were a couple of tables, large and extremely wide, like 100 or so, 200 or so columns. And it was strange. They took a long time to load. Now, educated guess, the foreign data wrapper was having issues. Basically, we had to be patient. We had to let it do its thing so that it would load up and populate the table. And it did, it, 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 did its, it, it did its thing. The other issue was data corruption. There was actually old records inside a couple of these tables that they had different character locales. Now Microsoft has a standard, and that standard is not followed consistent, it doesn't follow in the Unix environment, in, in the Linux environment. Linux is UTF-8, UTF-16, etc. It has, again, ANSI standard. So every so often, these tables would fail to load. And finally, we got around to it. We, we figured it out. By using the MSSQL client, we downloaded the data from SQL Server, loaded it back up to SQL Server, and then updated it from this new table to the original table. Basically, we just update, update, update. What happened was, is the data converted correctly when it was dumped on the Linux machine. So when that correction took place, it went back up and then it was just copied over for the thing that it worked. 
It was a stupid plunge, but hey, it worked. Um, any questions? Yes? Uh, how long is long? How long can you have to Okay, that's, that's a good point. Um, in industry terms, what we had here was a medium to small database. I think it's like 50 gigabytes. 50 gigabytes. Yeah, I, I, I normally, in the other places I've worked, I've worked from hundreds of gigabytes to, well, actually, uh, right now I manage a system around 200 terabytes. So, in terms of size, it's small. However, it took time. I would say the full conversion, the loading of the data took about an hour, hour and a half. And that was more or less the inefficiencies of the foreign data for itself. But, what was really extraordinary was if we just converted, when I ran the test initially, and we did create the tables, add the constraints, I did so just a few minutes. It was amazing. And this, it, it was like, we're talking of several thousand constraints, primary keys, foreign keys, and hundreds of views, and, all, and, and um, we, we rendered them. We had a tool called Schema Spy, which is an open source tool, and we connected it to Postgres, and it was a marvel to see all these tables all nicely leaned out. You can see these lines all connecting over. And the first comment was, we work with that? <laughs> yes, Jeff, you had a question. That was pretty much the same thing. I wanted yeah. to. So it's, yes? Would you have anything to add uh, about coming from, instead of Microsoft SQL, uh, pre relational database, like database? You mean? I, I, I'm, setting up to, to migrate from a database server running on natural, pretty outdated technology. We've got tables that have uh, inside of columns uh, at nested tables. Oh, is that like a race? Or yeah. opposite data types? Yeah. I don't know what we're going to do about it, but. I'll be relational. It depends on how well you can document it. Is, yeah, is it can, like, could you get it into an entity relationship diagram? Can you see what it looks like? I don't know the data that well, but I think I'll have to try and do something like that. Yeah. I think that would be the first step. So understanding it is the exercise of creating a relationship diagram. Yeah. Um, schema spy. One word. Schema spy. Google it. You'll find it. Uh, it's an amazing technology. I What's the data system itself that you've done? Which is what's it called? Database? ADA? ADA. ADA. Database. Oh. Oh, yeah. Schema might not be able to deal with it, but it's a good start to start mm -hmm. the, the work from there. Um, do you have the ability to do dumps, like schema dumps, of your system? No, we normally do just technical dumps. That's do you have that? Is there such a thing as catalogs on the database? Yeah. Yeah then that would be the first place to go to see what kind of information. One of the things that we found out when we were moving the views over, the information system, uh, the, system the information schema in the SQL Server, there's actually a two kilobyte limit. And there were these two views that, that were like eight kilobytes large. So it was, it, they were incomplete. So <clears throat> what happened was, using the MSSQL command line class, I went to the sys catalog, did some Googling, did some educated Googling, and found out the correct catalogs where the definitions were. And I pulled that over into Postgres and used that to read those on the, uh, the, the, the view. And then in one of the scripts, there was actually a little bit of work around that was encoded in. Um, bash scripts are great as long as the instructions are small. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I hope you enjoyed the talk. And again, uh, the, um, it is located on the GitLab. Let's see. Go to, yeah, there we go. Oops. There we go. And it's on the and back of the business cards. And when you succeed going there with a web browser, if you click up the next one, you'll see the other presentations. And the one tomorrow is about technical debt. And that one, oh, I've got such... <laughs> All right. Have a good lunch. Thank Thanks you. for coming. Thank you.